Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and today we will have a talk at the B site Las Vegas. This talk is about hacking, sorry, social engineering training human firewall. And it will be conducted by Rihanna. And Rihanna Schulz is from Kansas City, Missouri, where she attended the University of Central Missouri. Rihanna graduated in 2018 with her Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity, Secure Software Development, and later graduated in 2020 with her Master's of Science in Cybersecurity, Information Assurance. While in the industry, Rihanna has been exposed to numerous science-based classes and has, has a background in endpoint security engineering and network engineering. Rihanna works as a team lead out of the Security Operations Center at Garmin and as a part-time cybersecurity instructor at UCM. Rihanna currently volunteers as a coach for National Cyber League. Additionally, Rihanna guest speaks at numerous colleges and high schools discuss, discussing her industry experience across the Midwest for the cyber and computer science classes. Before we start, we have few announcements before we begin. Uh, we would first like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, Toyota, SEMGREP, BlueCat, Blue PlesTrack, and many more. It's their support, along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this possible. These talks are being streamed live, except in underground, and as a courtesy to our speakers and audience, we ask that you check and make sure your phone is on silent mode. If you have a question, we have the mic in the, at the center of the room. Please use it. We have a photo policy here, and the photo policy prohibits taking pictures with anybody in the frame without explicitly asking their permission. And uh, we will get started now. And thank you. Welcome, Rihanna. Thank you. Um, you all can take as many pictures as you want. I highly encourage it throughout this presentation. And before we begin, I personally want to thank each and every one of you for not only attending my speaking session today, but for coming to B Size Las Vegas 2023. We're going to be discussing social engineering, training the human firewall. And as a quick introduction, my name is Rihanna Schultz. I am from Kansas City, Missouri. In fact, as stated, right, I attended the University of Central Missouri. I had graduated in 2018 with my bachelor's of science in cybersecurity, secure software development, and then later again in 2020 with my master's of science in information assurance. I have a very big technical background in endpoint security engineering, network security engineering, and as of today, I am a team leader of a security operations center at Garmin. Besides my love and passion for this field, thank you, I do love science fiction books, specifically from the 1980s. Before I really deep dive into the contents throughout this presentation, I am requesting each and every one of you to keep an open mind. One of the most amazing things about being in the cybersecurity community is how we learn and grow from one another. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to be discussing how to start and how to mature your own phishing program within your business. We're going to be doing this by learning a word called user architecture. In fact, user architecture is built on two concepts, how a user thinks and how a user acts towards security threats. Because once we understand who our users are that make up our business, this is how we're gonna identify risk and how we can take our phishing metrics to learn more about our business and identify gaps in our education program. If phishing education is new to your business, that's all right. We all have to start somewhere. Phishing education can be very, very expensive. I'm going to be presenting you all a tool that you can hopefully bring back to your own corporate environment that is not only affordable, but is usable to deploy as well. So some historical knowledge about the data I'm going to be presenting throughout this presentation. In fact, when I was a graduate student, I had conducted my own research. This research was a psychological study as to why are our users interacting with phishing emails regardless if security education is already present. And for me to do this, I had taken a participant pool of 100 plus users. In fact, these users had backgrounds in computer science, software engineering, 
and cybersecurity. My audience were not novice to security threats, specifically phishing. And not only did I want to understand why are they interacting with phishing emails, but can I grow and mature their security mindset by exposing them to different threats and different levels of difficulty of phishing? And for me to do this, I had phished them with three campaigns. Each campaign focused on two threats. I focused on phishing a barrel, spear phishing, and then lastly, spoofing. Each campaign progressively got a little bit harder. And for me to measure the difficulty of these fish, I had created my own algorithm. This algorithm highlighted the fact that the more phishing attributes a phishing email had, the higher the likelihood a user should be able to spot that this is a fish. So like I said, right, for me to understand who my users are, or specifically my participants throughout my research, I had to learn about user architecture. User architecture is built on two concepts. The first one being, how does a user think towards security threats? Where do our users get their influence from? Us as security professionals. And if you have been in the field for a hot minute, or in fact, if you grew your management career and you're in leadership now, it is very difficult for us to put ourselves back in the shoes of a user. How does our users think? So I like to use this example Leadership wants a small click percentage because it shows awareness is improving. In fact, if you had first deployed phishing in your environment, it probably was not uncommon that your click rate was at a 50 to 60%. And as you continue to fish your users, that 50 to 60% is no longer sustainable and it'll probably start plateauing and you're hitting that one to three mark. So leadership is gonna see that trend and go, wow, when we first started phishing, our users clicked a lot. Yeah, they weren't trained, right? So now, as they continue getting involved, they're seeing that little bar graph go down at that one to three percent. They're like, yes, they're not clicking anymore. Our phishing program is working. Why? Why are they not clicking? So now we take ourselves back to the user mindset. If we have a user, right, our day-to-day -day average user, they probably know that cybersecurity sends out annual phishing reminders. In fact, they probably talk about this in new employee orientation saying, hey, you're gonna get phished. This associate probably also knows that phishing campaign happens end of the month, maybe the third or fourth week of the month, right? So if this user comes into work, they open up their email, and they notice that there's something unexpected. They look at the calendar of by, by sure, right? It's third week of the month. They're gonna ask their coworker, hey, did you see this? Coworker goes, yeah, I saw it. I reported it to cybersecurity. I got that automated notification. User goes, okay, cool. They forward it, they also got that notification. Now what if this company has awards, right? He send and report six of those phishing emails in the year, you might get a swag item, recognition a team meeting, right? So not only do they understand when phishing is occurring and that there is a phishing assessment, but now they too wanna to set their team up for success because everyone should get an award here. They screenshot that email and they post it in their Slack, their Teams, their Discord, whatever communication platform they have, right? Because now everyone can be part of cybersecurity. Of course, that one to three percent is gonna look good for leadership, but there's a story behind it. So we're not training our users to think like security analysts, to be inspired, to protect against threats. We're training our users to adapt to our environments. So the second part of user architecture is, oh, sorry is knowing thy audience, right? Who makes up the bodies of our business? How do you know the users? And I'm not talking about taking them to happy hour, learning their favorite color, their birthday, their mother's maiden name. No, I don't care about that. I wanna know the types of departments that make up my business. And I use this two example here. We have Dave. Dave works in finance. I feel like we all work with the Dave, right? Dave is a great employee, works Monday to Friday, nine to five, really supports that culture and mission and vision of the company. What can we say that Dave's email traffic looks like? Dave, who works in finance, probably works very closely with customer accounts, maybe payroll. What about benefits and 401k services, right? Dave's responsibility is to understand where the money is going. What about Steve? Steve works in sales. Steve is also a great employee. What about Steve's email traffic? 
Steve, who works in sales, probably works very closely with customers, a lot of external entities. Steve probably also works very closely with marketing and communications and public relations because he is advertising the product that's making the business revenue. Since we want to know not only who our users are, this is important because this is how they're going to act towards security threats. Dave and Steve, in this hypothetical scenario, work at the same company. This company got targeted with a phishing attack. In fact, this might be a new form of phishing, meaning that a lot of email signatures and firewall signatures haven't scanned enough of this threat to stop it at the point. This phishing email made it to the end user. Both Dave and Steve got this. The contents of this email state, hey, there was an error in our benefit system. You have been dropped from benefits. You have 24 hours to click the link below. If this is a mistake, please re-enroll. Dave, who works in finance, who works very closely with 401k and benefits, sees this and goes, this is not an authorized email. In fact, this isn't even our benefits provider. We don't do benefits through a .ru. Dave is going to forward this to cybersecurity. What is the likelihood? Steve is going to have the same reaction. We work, and the reality is, we work with users who don't even think about their benefits until they get that annual reminder at the end of the year. I see some of you in this room. So what is the likelihood Steve's going to have that same reaction? This is why user architecture is very important, because we need to know how to train our users across all different types of threats. So if phishing is a new topic for you, I use a platform called Go Get Fish. Go Get Fish is a open source tool. It is free. I am very skeptical sometimes using projects with open source just because the developers might publish this on GitHub and then they forget about it and move on to the next big thing, right? The developers are very in tune with the community. They post a lot of feature requests, even patches, updates, because they want to make sure security education is present in businesses. If you do not know this fun fact, cybersecurity 90% of the time does not make a business revenue. We cost the business revenue. So when you get to that point in the year and you get a stack of money, it is not uncommon that cybersecurity is at the bottom of that tone pole, right? Because you have to support your firewalls. You have to do logging. Logging is very expensive, right? SOAR, et cetera, right? Security education might be at the very bottom. And reputable tools are usually a pay-per-user basis. So by no means am I trying to sell you on a product. This is me providing you a tool that you can use and bring back. Um, also, I am not an application developer. This was very usable for me to deploy. When I had conducted my research environment, I had deployed this on a Linux virtual machine on my desktop. I had 100 plus participants. One of the nice usable features was that I was able to bulk upload all of these users at once instead of manually adding them. I do not have time for that. Also, this is a phishing assessment. I'm not sending phishing emails from my personal email address. So I had created emails through Gmail, Microsoft, Yahoo, AOL. And what's nice was I had a webhook integration back to my Go Get Fish service, and that way I can authenticate back to these SMTP services. Lastly, I wanted a level of maturity. Go Get Fish allowed me to dynamically send these emails out, meaning no user received the same email at the same time. Because I don't know if they work together. I don't know if they live together. They're college students, right? So when I crafted my emails in the service, it authenticated back to the SMTP server. SMTP server said, yep, these are valid credentials. Go get fish said, all right, send these emails out. And they distributed it out to my participants. My participants had two options, interact with the email or not. And if they did interact with the email, they clicked on it, and it went to a survey hosted website called surveymonkey.com. Surveymonkey.com was great for me because A, it's free. And also, if a user had clicked on the email, that was a metric it automatically collected. I have presented my participant, hey, you clicked on a phishing email. It happens. Here are some resources on how to spot phishing in the future. And then I presented them with some open and close-ended questions. So I'm pretty sure you might be curious as to the types of emails that I sent my participants. And like I said, I wanted to understand why are they clicking on emails, and can I grow their education mindset? The first campaign focused on fish in a barrel. If you are not familiar with fish in a barrel, it's a very Western term. It comes from when a fisherman will go out fishing, all of their winnings they would throw in a wooden barrel, end of the day when it's time for dinner, 
They just grabbed their hand in the barrel, picked out a random fish, and that's where they're eating. Fishing today has a little bit of a different concept. Threat actors would send out mass quantities of emails, specifically looking at spam, marketing, maybe shopping ads. They just want that one click. So this campaign had a very high severity score, meaning there were a lot of phishing attributes. And you can kind of see specifically with the first one, right? It says, hello, please see the given for more information, random spaces, random punctuation. Sincerely, your professor. As also a reminder, my participant background was computer science, software engineering, cybersecurity. There were a lot of clicks on this. I was shocked. I said, why? Well, one of the reasons was they have a habit of clicking on emails before analyzing them. And if you can also see here in the very other column, um, followed by, I was curious. I don't care. And my antivirus protects me from all the threats. They were running Windows Defender. <laughs> so I said, OK, cool. What happens if I send the same type of threat with the same level of severity a second time, right? Because I'm trying to learn about the users that are in my participant pool. The second fish highlights, hey, we know financial might be hard if you're a college student. Fill out the survey for your time. We'll send you a gift card. Help us help you. There were a significant less amount of clicks on this. But again, right, we have users that weren't paying attention and users that have a habit of clicking on emails before analyzing them. It's probably the same participant from the first fish. So I said, all right, let's do this again. Let's increase the level of difficulty. So I took away some phishing attributes. And I focused on a different type of threat, focused on spear phishing. I wanted to have a psychological relationship with my participants. The first fish, I wanted to scare them. And the email contents say, hey, you were using the university network. In fact, you were looking up inappropriate content while on the university network. Please click this link to enroll it in training so you know how to use the network appropriately in the future. There were a lot of clicks. <laughs> I don't know about you. I personally do not want to look at a college student's proxy data, let alone browser history. In fact, there was an apology letter on that other column. <laughs> but the number one reason being there was a sense of urgency that flexed their way of thinking. I said, all right, let's send a second fish. Am I going to have that same result from the first campaign? And instead of a sense of scare, I want to have a sense of trust. And if you're not familiar with university networks or how the environment is set up, it's not uncommon. People work on sharing platforms. And that's because there's international students. There's remote students, right? So having an online cloud platform is very common. And that's what this fish focused on. It said, hey, we're all working on a homework assignment. Please click the Google Doc if you want to collaborate with us. There were a significant less amount of clicks with this. And some of the reasonings, right? More paying attention, seemed legit. Um, that other column, another one for curiosity, and I don't care. So I said, all right, this is why I had three campaigns. Because now I might start seeing a pattern develop. I'm starting to learn about my users, how they're thinking, and how they're acting. That third campaign is going to show if there is actually a pattern. This is a coincidence to me. I want to identify a pattern. And so I focused on spoofing as my very last campaign. If you do not have DMARC or DCAM signing in your environment, this is a big risk. I highly, highly encourage you to put that on the roadmap for 2024 as a form of security for your environment. Now, unlike the first two campaigns, this campaign had little to no phishing attributes. So this should be very difficult for a user to spot. The first email, I had actually spoofed my university address. And it highlights, thank you for participating in my research. As a form of gratitude, please retrieve the gift card below for your time. And there were a lot of clicks. With the number one reason being it seems legit, which is awesome, right? That is the focus of spoofing. It's supposed to look like a legit email. So then I said, all right, let's do this a second time. I want to see if there's a pattern with my user architecture. So the second one, I, this one's personally my favorite because I was a little mean about this. Um, I had taken a University of Technology office email. I had scraped the contents and adjusted the words so it's a little more scary. And I had also took the signature and their office hours off of the university website. And it says, hey, your university credentials were found in a recent cyber breach. Please reset your credentials so that way you can help keep the university secure. Thank you for your time. Again. 
there were a lot of clicks. With the number one reason being that it seemed legit. So if you remember my first two campaigns, the first fish had a high number of clicks. The second fish had a significant less amount. This campaign was an outlier. In fact, if I had conducted these exact same fish in my corporate environment, and my leadership goes, what happened to our metrics? They were all over the place. And I would say, stop, just pause for a second, because this isn't bad. This is a gap that we have with security education. This is a risk stating if we got fish with spoofing, there is a likely higher percentage our users are gonna interact with it. Let's fish them again because we need to train our users. We need to evolve their mindset because they too are part of a firewall in our business. So what can you do as security professionals to improve your mindset, right? Because again, our users are getting their influence from us as security professionals. Set a realistic phishing goal. That is number one, right? I hear so many times how people just deploy phishing programs and then they do nothing with the data. Your data is telling a story about your business. So if you're at a one to 3% right now with a click, that is showing your users are not challenged, they're plateauing. I guarantee you, if you look at the types of fish that you're sending, they might have a high number of phishing attributes or they're all focused on the same thing. I, had, um, I did this talk before, I had a user one time say that they only send out phishing for Amazon UPS and FedEx package notifications. And I said, you gotta change it. <laughs> Otherwise your users are gonna adapt, right? So send something that's a little different. Send a spoofing email. You're more than welcome to use any of the examples I showed you today. I guarantee you, if you put an outlier in your fishing pool, that one to 3% might go up to a 10 to 12 click percentage. So now you see where your users are plateauing. You see where they have been challenged with a new type of threat. Find a happy medium. Aim for that set, like five to seven, maybe five to eight percent, because that's the area where your users are growing, they're being inspired, and they're being engaged, and they're wanting to learn about cybersecurity, specifically phishing. A low click percent should not be an achievement unlocked. It should show that your users are not growing at all. So the next thing I always want to talk about is what can you do to improve your phishing pool? You do not have to be the Bob Ross of cybersecurity to create these wonderful, fantastic phishing emails. We are in a tech field for a reason, right? Read the news. In fact, Microsoft last year had released an advisory for an O365 fish. This fish looked like a legit Microsoft document. And when a user clicked on it and went to an O365 login page that scraped a corporate's credential login. So it looked legit. Researchers were spreading this very high on social media. Microsoft posted images of what this fish looked like. How many of you read that and decided I should put this in my fishing pool? These are real threats that are happening in the real world. So train your users on what is going on. Next, I always recommend working with your tier one service desk or even your security operations center. These people are your first eyes and ears to the business for security threats. Look to see how many legit phishing emails were reported. How many Dave's reported that email compared to how many Steve's? Ask yourself this question, what about your IT admins? People with access to confidential restricted data. What if they got phished? Would they have reported that as well? And then very lastly, look to see what your security stack is blocking. These are actual threats targeting your business. Is there a trend of these threats? Take one of these threats and put them in your fishing pool. Security stack does fail sometimes. It's a small risk, but there are moments where they do go offline. So if this does happen, are your users able to spot this as a fish? Us as security professionals, we have the mindset of forever pushing patching, updating our firewalls, our blacklist. We should have the same mindset with our users. Grow and mold and challenge them. So again, thank you all for attending my speaking session. If you had missed any of the QR codes, I am presenting it here. Um, I really do enjoy connecting with the cybersecurity community on LinkedIn. You are more than encouraged to add me. Um, if you wanna learn more about Go Get Fish, it's that middle QR code, and the very last one is the full research. So if you wanted to use any of the phishing that you saw the day, you are more than welcome to with my permission. Thank you.
Thank you, Rihanna, for this excellent talk. Uh, if you have any question for her, please approach here and ask. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you. Great presentation today. Two questions. One is, um, we're seeing a behavior where uh, enterprises are sending out fake phishing attacks, but then IT is sending out lots and lots of traffic that is legitimate that has click-through links. So it really, even, even as a digital forensics and incident response professional, I, I'm like, how you are confusing the heck out of the users. Yes. I'm saying this to IT, so if, you, I, if you've seen that. And then one other question that has crossed my desk. The Wall Street Journal about two weeks, two, three weeks ago, wrote an in-depth story about how employees are being, are pissed off about fake phishing attacks and it's and it's be becoming a hostile work environment issue. I bring that up because it's just about the same time I had the meeting about this with this client about their phishing looking just like their legitimate emails that have lots of links in them coming from IT. So what thoughts and comments do you have about these issues? Okay, I'll start with the first question. Um, me personally, uh, throughout my different experience, especially working with different companies and everything, um, it is very difficult, especially if my favorite is when users report their, hey, your password is going to expire email as a fish. Um, there are ways where, A, you can put actual email banners. And we work very closely with our comms department. So that way, when there's like a legit business-wide email about to go out, it's also posted on our internal documentation. And so that way, users can always reference that. Um, banners, documentation, and then also to kind of automate that process, right? Uh, whenever a user does forward internal email that we know for sure, especially if it's coming from one of our tech processes or a ticketing system, um, there's an automated response back to them. So that way they know, and then they know where to retrieve it, which is usually their sent folder, and then that way they become less disgruntled. Uh, going back to the disgruntled question, there is a very, very fine balance between usability and security. And it's hard, especially if you're trying to push security education. Um, from my experience and then also from what I hear in the community, a great way to encourage users and not be so disgruntled is to give them those awards, right? That recognition. Uh, we have sometimes like acknowledgments in our global wide meetings and we're like, hey, these are users that consistently report our education. Thanks for being rock stars. And that way, you know, it's a small win for the user because we're not trying to waste their time, right? This is, this is important to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't financially be spending money on it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.